Chang, live from Los Angeles. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, IBM takes a tumble, its stock price plunging despite strong sales. We look at the company's first quarter results. Plus, Tesla's second time out. The electric car manufacturer stopped production on its Model 3 sedans and sent workers home. But new reports are just out. The company is now changing gears and asking employees for 24-7 shifts. Details ahead. And Apple pushes deeper into news, but can a subscription-based news feed be as successful as Apple Music? First to our lead. IBM shares tumbling in after-hours trading, the company's first quarter gross margins missing analyst estimates. This coming despite IBM notching another win in its campaign to reverse years of revenue declines as it reported its second straight period of sales growth. First quarter sales rose 5.1% to $19.1 billion, beating analyst estimates. IBM's new strategic imperatives unit saw a 15% rise in revenue from the year before, this including the company's cloud and analytics and mobile focused businesses. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg Intelligence's Anurag Rana in New York. So Anurag, walk us through the main weaknesses here. Well, the biggest issue is gross margins. This has been an issue for some time. Uh, we've, wrote, we've written about it that uh, even in this year, we should see slight decline in gross margins, although the pace of decline is not going to be as bad as last year. Um, that remains the number one concern at this point, um, which, is, which we believe is driving down the stock. And does that outweigh the bright spots, security, cloud, analytics? Well, if you were to take currency off, um, they grew revenues flat, so that's year over year. So that's similar to what's been happening for the last uh, one, one and a half years. So I won't, uh, you know, get too excited about the push because of currency. Uh, but when it comes to the gross margin, that's your profitability of the, the products that you're selling. You know, they have, um, uh, you know, issues going in, more investments in cloud. They have cloud-based products that are taking over your legacy products, and they have lower margins to begin with. And then uh, they have pricing pressure on legacy IT services contracts. So if a contract comes for renewal, you're seeing some pricing pressure on it, and all those three factors are having an impact on gross margins. And let's dig into IBM's role in the bigger picture questions about tech regulation that are happening here. IBM will likely benefit from increased focus on customer data privacy in Europe and beyond as a result of, of GDPR. Explain that to me. So that's IBM's tagline. What IBM is basically saying is, you know, you have a large portion of your data on your own data centers. What we can make sure is we'll give you a hybrid cloud environment, which is a mix of your own data center as well as our uh, private cloud. Uh, and, you know, you can move the data back and forth, but it's still going to re be remain in your domain. And that's their marketing uh, push around it. Um, with GDPR, they actually have seen some really good growth in their security business, where people are using a lot of their consulting and other security products to make their, um, you know, you could say company more GDPR compliant. So if that's the marketing spin, do you buy it? Will it really material help, materially help the business? So we believe that the public cloud vendors are also, um, I would say, GDPR compliant. You have uh, you know, cloud application vendors. They are also GDPR compliant. The question is really, what does the client want? Does the client want to move a large portion of their infrastructure into a public cloud environment, or they are happy with a hybrid cloud environment? Now, in the case of a public cloud environment, they do have a public cloud offering, but that work, and you know, in our view, goes more to Amazon and Microsoft and Google. But if they look at a hybrid cloud environment, even then you would say, you know, a large portion of that goes to Microsoft and some of it to IBM. IBM's also making a push into emerging technologies, but again, with IBM, it's always how much will this impact the bottom line? So let's talk about blockchain, for example. IBM, you know, really trying to be on the forefront of, of, of blockchain, but at this point, you know, you know, what do you make of how much these efforts will actually improve the business? 
Yeah, so Emily, when it, whether it's blockchain or Watson, you know, collectively these do not account for a large portion of their current revenue base. If you look at it, you know, at, you know run rate of 18, 19 billion a quarter, um, these are very small portion right now. Having said that, if you're really investing in blockchain, IBM has a good strategy there because they have the hardware that goes with it. They're, and they're trying to use their services arm, whether it's consulting or whether it is using their engineers to create a custom solution. So whether it's blockchain, IoT, uh, artificial intelligence, they do have a presence there. But uh, once again, very small portion of the total revenue base, a large portion of the revenue is still declining and it's still a lot of the legacy products. All right, Anurag Rana of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you so much for breaking it all down. We'll continue to follow IBM shares. Well, as we've been reporting all day, Tesla has temporarily suspended production of its Model 3 sedan. And this would be the second time in two months that the electric car maker has been forced to put the brakes on the Model 3. But we do now have new reports that Tesla is switching to 24-7 shifts for employees. According to Jalopnik, CEO Elon Musk is now ramping up production of the Model 3 sedan to 6,000 units per week by June. Musk spent time on Twitter last week acknowledging production problems at Tesla plants and arguing with The Economist magazine, saying Tesla will be profitable and cash flow positive this year. So just what's going on with Tesla and production? Again, to answer that question, I want to bring back Bloomberg Business Week columnist Max Chafkin, who's been digging into this new report and covering the turmoil at Tesla. So first of all, Max, I know you've been reading through this new report. A lot of juicy stuff in here from production halt to 6,000 uh, Model 3s a week. What do you make of it? All right, so the, the first thing we should say is, although Elon Musk appears to be working 24 seven famously, as he's told uh, pretty much everyone who listened, sleeping at the factory, the, these 24 seven shifts are shifts, right? So it'd be like probably three different crews of people. It's not as if these Tesla employees are working around the clock, uh, although many executives probably are. Um, the other thing that's happening here is, Musk is saying in this memo, which was published by Jalopnik just short, just a few minutes ago, that uh, <clears throat> the plan here is to have the shutdown and then to sort of ramp up. Now, we saw a similar kind of shutdown followed by a ramp up uh, a few weeks back, which allowed them to hit this 2,000 uh, unit milestone that, that we saw at the end of the last quarter. The plan now, he's saying, is they want to be at 6,000 by the end of the second quarter. And he says in this memo, which is a, a sort of a fascinating uh, you know, uh, look at the psychology of Elon Musk, that the idea, the idea here is to build a little cushion so that even if they fall short of the 6,000, which Tesla has been wont to do, they'll probably get 5,000, which is the goal that they've been sort of promising to, to investors all along. Uh, there's also uh, uh, information about a plan to, to add lots more employees. He said that they're going to be adding 400 employees a week to their two factories uh, in the coming weeks, and uh, a really big push for profit to make sure that Tesla gets to profitability. Tesla shares are up on the news. Here's a quote from Musk in that memo. We are burning the midnight oil to burn the midnight oil. That said, Max, you know, obviously the production halt, not good news. You know, how bad is this bad news in the grander scheme of things? So it's it's really hard to know, and I, I really caution people into into reading into the tea leaves too much because the thing is that that production halts, as Tesla has said, are sort of something that happens. Now now the thing is when you something that happens not just at Tesla but at, at lots of companies, you have to you know reset the line or make sure the tooling's right or there there, there are reasons to stop production that are, are 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 not bad. That said, there have been lots of these sort of unexpected things, and that would cause somebody who's kind of a Tesla skeptic and and there are lots of those out there to see this as just yet another sign that this company is in over its head. That said, if the numbers keep moving in the right direction, I think investors are going to be happy. And, you know, Elon Musk will look like a genius. What do you make of Elon's comments last week on CBS that he overdid it? on automation. So that, yeah, that's a huge uh, shift because one of the key things that Tesla had been talking about as a, you know, differentiator is that this was going to be the most automated car factory uh, in the world. That was going to allow them to hit these crazy uh, ambitious production numbers. The problem as we've been learning with automation is that it's harder to plug people in. And what it seems like is happening in the factory when you, when you sort of start putting 
pulling different um, sort of little tidbits that are that are filtering out of there is is Tesla is moving much more towards a traditional sort of human focused manufacturing process, which is why they're adding all of these employees, which is why they're adding shifts, um, and and which is why they have to focus on profit because they spent all of this money on these machines, which is supposed to save money in the long run. But now you have to add employees on top of that, so that's going to create a lot of uh, cost pressure on, on on a company that already you know doesn't have uh, you know is already losing money. So shares are up, but at what point might customers start asking for their deposits back? So, if that's not happening already. Yeah, this is a, a sort of superpower that Tesla has, which is that people are super fans of this company. And and I think in terms of the those who have already, you know, uh, put down the deposit. This is about half a million people. Th this is not their primary car. So, and it, and we're only talking about a thousand dollars. So, I think we're still a long ways off from that. That said, the longer this drags out, and and the the more we get these delays, and 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 you're going to start to see other car companies coming out with compelling products. You know, the greater the danger is for Tesla. And it's not so much about these customers asking for their money back as investors sort of buying into a, a larger vision of Tesla. As potentially, you know, the biggest auto manufacturer in the U.S. If if all they have are the customers who put in deposits, that's not going to be good enough. They need to, you know, keep adding these giant uh, cohorts of customers basically each year to sort of hit the vision that that Elon Musk is talking about. Now, I do want to acknowledge the tweeting. Elon Musk continuing his sort of adversarial relationship with the media. This tweet to the Economist: The Economist used to be boring but smart with a wicked dry wit. Now it's just boring. Sigh. You know, another tweet talking about how ideas pop into his head. Um, a follower asked, you know, what were you thinking when you came up with such and such? And he said, too wasted to remember. You know, at what point do investors start getting distracted by the state of mind here. Okay, so he has always been a pugnacious sort, and I think that is part of the uh, that's part of the appeal. That that's part of what uh, people like about him. It, it, in terms of the the tweeting and and things like that, I think that the the sort of probably greater area of concern would be all these sort of side projects. Uh, in addition to Tesla and SpaceX, you know, there is an AI thing. There's a, the tunnel thing. Uh, it, this is a guy. He's apparently you know hiring a humorist for, from the Onion, uh, and, and so it's I think it's more about sort of distraction in terms of in terms of uh, Possible danger to Tesla, rather than uh, Elon Musk tweeting intemperate things. I think um, many of his admirers, you know, enjoy the intemperate uh, comments, and certainly for us in the press, uh, it gives us something to talk about. So, so I don't think it's definitely an area of, of risk. Some of those tweets do take time, though. Uh, I have to say, Bloomberg Business Suite columnist Max Chafkin, thank you as always for keeping us up to date. Now, to a stock we are watching, Netflix continues to surge on its impressive first quarter earnings report out Monday, the streaming company adding 7.4 million users in the period, according to a statement easily topping analyst projections. The results, including higher earnings and an upbeat forecast, were welcome news to investors. Netflix rose as much as 9.8% to an all-time high on Tuesday. The stock was up 60% this year at Monday's close. Coming up, Microsoft's president, Brad Smith, joins us. Why 34 major tech companies, including Microsoft, Facebook, and Dell, are joining forces to fight cyber attacks. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Facebook, Microsoft, and 30-plus other tech companies have pledged to protect their customers from cyber attack in a new pledge called the Cybersecurity Tech Accord. However, notably absent from the initial roster of signups are Apple, Amazon, Twitter, and Google. On Monday, U.S. and U.K. officials issued a joint warning about years of cyber attacks stemming from Russia aimed at both businesses and utilities, and in some cases, individuals. The warning was only the latest in a series of Russian threats to elections and electoral systems. Joining us now to discuss, Brad Smith, Microsoft's president and chief legal officer. Brad, first of all, you know, part of this pledge, you're saying you won't help governments protect or perpetrate cyber attacks. You know, talk to us about why there is a need for such an accord. Well, I think our industry really needs to come together on a global basis to strengthen cybersecurity. 
We need to be principled as we do that. And there's fundamentally two principles that are part of this pledge. The first is that we will step up our work to protect every customer everywhere from these cyber attacks. And the second is that we won't help governments launch cyber attacks against innocent citizens or enterprises. And we'll use those as two North Stars, and there are a number of concrete steps we can and will take to make those effective. So are governments asking you for help for them Absolutely. to perpetrate cyber attacks? Oh, the, the, first of all, we get most importantly requests from governments every day to help defend against customers, and we are doing more in that space. Um, in the world today, uh, I think if your principles are unclear, you do run the risk that you'll be asked by governments to do things that you're going to look back at in hindsight and regret having done. And we've seen that over the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, and I think by being clear about what we will and will not do, we in effect give governments guidance so they don't have to ask us. They know where we stand. So you've referred to this as the Digital Geneva Convention, yet Apple, Amazon, Twitter, Google, they're not signed up. Why not? Well, I think we're going to see more companies sign up in the coming weeks and months. Uh, a lot of people have been very focused on a wide variety of privacy and security issues recently. Uh, we have 34 major companies with us today for this tech accord. And then what we are also doing is calling on governments to sign up for a digital Geneva Convention. In effect, a new convention that would put new rules in the ro of the road in place so that governments understand that they can't attack civilians the way we're seeing in the world today. Facebook has been in the spotlight for inadvertently allowing state actors to meddle in elections, in U.S. elections. Why should we think of this as any more than an empty promise or a marketing ploy? Well, I first of all think that in the world today, it's important for companies to be principled. You can't be principled unless you define clearly and in a transparent way what you're going to do and what you're going to stand up for. And we're doing that. But I also believe that you're making a fundamentally important point. At the end of the day, people should not judge us by our words alone. They should judge us by our deeds. This gives people a clear standard against which they can judge us. I think we should welcome that. Now it's up to us to prove every day that we can live up to this pledge. Facebook also, I'm sure as you all know, also under fire for data privacy. And I'm curious where you think Facebook went wrong and whether you think more regulation is necessary in big tech, since that could ultimately impact Microsoft as well. well I think it's the broader question that is the most important. It's a question for all of us. We at Microsoft called for national comprehensive privacy legislation. We did that in 2005, 13 years ago. This whole privacy issue does not get better with age. We do need to come together as a country, in our view, and we will benefit from having good laws in place. We'll benefit because there'll be a consensus nationally about what companies should do, and we'll benefit because that, I believe, can play an important role in sustaining the trust and confidence of the public. You've also announced a new Defending Democracy program to help prevent campaigns from being hacked, to defend against disinformation, misinformation. Can you give us some specifics about how you intend to do that? Are you working with particular campaigns or particular states or working to secure voting machines, for example, ahead of the midterm elections? The answer is basically going to be yes to all of that. We have identified four specific areas on which we want to focus with this new Defending Democracy project. Uh, the first is protecting candidates and campaigns from hacking. Uh, the second is protecting voters and voting from tampering or hacking. The third is really uh, supporting measures to ensure integrity in political advertising, including on social media platforms, one of the things the Honest Ads Act will do. And the last is really, in some ways, the hardest. It's the job we all need to do to try to address the willful disinformation campaigns we're seeing even from foreign sources. And so in some of these areas, we have fast steps that we can take right away. In other areas, I think we have a lot of hard work ahead of us, but we need to get started. So also, last quick question. You're announcing a new micro-device product 
a teeny tiny little IoT product that is secured end to end, could be in anything from toys to remote controls, works with AWS, works with Google Cloud. What are the dangers here that you're trying to protect against? Well, this, I believe, is a fundamentally important problem for the country and the world, because this year there will be shipped in the world 9 billion of these small chips that increasingly are going into toys, refrigerators, thermostats, certainly in cars and the like, and they're all going to be connected. And if they're connected without being protected, then we have a much bigger cybersecurity problem than we do today. What we launched yesterday here in San Francisco is a new offering, we call it Azure Sphere, and with a new and more powerful and more secure hardware chip, and a new, more secure operating system, and a new security cloud service, we really, for the okay. first time, have a holistic solution. Microsoft President Brad Smith in San Francisco. Brad, as always, thanks so much for stopping by. Coming up, will the Defense Department change its winner-take-all strategy in the competition for the Pentagon's cloud? We'll talk about that next. This is Bloomberg. The Defense Department isn't budging from its decision to award a single contract for a cloud computing project. And isn't saying why, even in a public exchange with vendors this week over details of the multi-billion dollar competition. Rival contractors like Oracle are complaining that the winner-take-all approach favors Amazon, the biggest supplier of cloud services. IBM, another potential bidder, says no major commercial enterprise should risk a single cloud solution and neither should the Pentagon. Coming up, over $20 billion was used by venture capitalists in Europe just last year to invest in European startups. We'll talk to two London-based VCs who say Europe is where the money's at. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technology, I'm Emily Chang from Los Angeles. Back to our top story, Tesla's continuing manufacturing woes. Tesla is shifting into overdrive to try and resolve its Model 3 production problems. After earlier reports that the electric car manufacturer was temporarily halting production on the sedan, we are now hearing that will begin around-the-clock production at its Fremont, California auto plant. In addition to this, Tesla is getting a boost from China. Beijing plans to remove foreign ownership limits for auto ventures within China in the next four years. Right now, overseas companies can own no more than 50% of a joint venture with a Chinese partner. Musk had been trying for more than a year to open an assembly plant in China, but failed to agree on the ownership structure with Shanghai's government. Now it seems every week there is a new announcement of money being raised for European startup investing. After a record year in 2017 and more than $20 billion put to work by VCs in the region, firms are raising new funds in 2018 to make the most of increased investment opportunities and institutional interest. I want to bring in Caroline Hyde, who's got two venture capitalists who've announced new funds this week alone. Caroline, take it away. Emily, yes, thank you very much indeed. I'm now joined by not at one but two VC funds. I'm pleased to introduce Hawken Overly. He is coming from Dawn Capital, general partner over there, and the CEO of Octopus Ventures it is Elliot Cole. Gentlemen, both this week you have announced new funds, and I want to start with Dawn Capital. $235 million is what you've been raising, and more than you aimed for. Where is the more, where's the interest coming in terms of money flows into your fund? So I think um, we're seeing a real shift in uh, U.S. interest. A lot of it, we've been very lucky. We've got um, huge support from our existing investors. 80% came back. One of them is uh, EIF, one of them is uh, BBB. But really the extra, the extra demand is coming from U.S. investors who are now seeing this Europe as a very attractive place to invest in venture. They've, the really sophisticated investors have seen uh, they've been doing this for decades now and they've typically been in the big funds like Sequoia or whatever and they've seen how successful that's been and then they've invested as the wave has gone from west to east, Chicago, New York and now they're seeing the next land of opportunities as Europe. Europe, the land of opportunities, Elliot, and, and of course fundraising continues at Octopus Ventures, 284 million more that's just been announced. 
you say that this now sets you up to be able to continue when it comes to seed vent and, and new ventures. What about the size of checks? Are they getting bigger? Are the valuations getting bigger when you're putting the money to work in the, in the opportunities that you see? So we've seen a, a growing trend of um, really talented entrepreneurs coming to us with um, fantastic ideas, with a growing global ambition. Um, and we've seen no shortage of those entrepreneurs come to us, particularly at the seed and series A level. There has been an increase in funding size over the last 10 years. The series A used to be about two million pounds, yeah. and it's not uncommon to see a seed round at this level. Um, but in terms of valuations, I suspect they're stabilizing a little bit more um, in recent months. At Dawn Capital, you focus particularly on software as a service, SaaS and fintech. Yeah. Where are we seeing the hubs develop in Europe for these particular types of business? Are they growing anywhere nowadays or is still London the fintech hub? Are we seeing... No, I think talented entrepreneurs kind of are born everywhere. It's mm. One of the sort of Silicon Valley myths is that actually most of the entrepreneurs there are not born there. They're exported for, or imported from elsewhere. So you see talented entrepreneurs uh, across Europe. I think UK is still an important hub, both for software and fintech. Despite Brexit? Yeah, I, I think uh, yeah, it has had no impact yet because this is where the money is, this is where the expertise is. Um, the ecosystem is super important to be able to hire talented people at all levels, and the UK is, is unparalleled for that. You see, you know, London, I think, you know, attracted more than $3 billion investment last year, and the UK was f just short of $5 billion. And whilst that, I think, puts London head and shoulders above the rest of Europe, we're, you know, within our own portfolio, we've backed entrepreneurs who set up in you know, Lis Lisbon and um, Stockholm and then uh, Central and Eastern Europe as well. So, you know, Hawke is absolutely right that the most talented entrepreneurs are seeing the success from their peer group across Europe and, and, and starting out wherever they might be. And what about the industry groups that you're looking at, the, the vertical yeah. within technology that you're looking at? Because you've you back companies such as SwiftKey that was bought by Microsoft, that's in, in AI. We're looking at Magic Pony, yeah. which is video uh, the area of growth. What, what verticals are you particularly keen on? So we always start with the people and we're quite happy you know, being bold and taking a risk on an entrepreneur. But having said that, we're seeing a concentration around retail and you know, businesses like Chronext are coming from a kind of consumer spe uh, perspective. Uh, we also have um, B2B plays which are helping retailers sell more effectively. Um, and likewise, digital health has been a, a big focus for us in, in the last two years. We've backed three or four businesses, including um, Big Health and MediSafe, which are you know, going on to big things at the moment. Hawken, I want to talk to you about an area of focus for you, which is diversity. It's something you've written on in the British press. How are you ensuring that as these companies that you back scale, they scale with the ethics that you want to see, with the diversity that you want to see? Yes, uh, it's a question of governance Ali is that it's hard for two white males to talk <laughs> to talk about it but we all have to do what we we can and it starts with governance and it's, it's a, a job of a board to set the right directions and everybody has to do what they can and we always hire the best and well, luckily for us that recently two of the best the two best candidates were, were very talented female uh, venture capitalists uh, so everybody has to do what they can and now we're really trying to encourage female founders which are still un underrepresented in, in, any, uh, in every way we can. And it's, I think on governance, I think we can now start talking about where Europe is better at certain things than the US and governance is certainly one of them. It, normally CEO and chairman is split, independent board members more concerned, more of a culture of these kinds of things. And all the research shows that better governance, better diversity, better all these things leads to better outcomes. So that's a, that's a big driver for everyone and should be for everyone. Let's just talk for about dawn. let's talk about outcomes. Let's talk about exits mm. because as I just mentioned a couple of the companies that you've been back we've seen trade sales when it comes to Octopus and indeed Dawn but we've seen IPOs when it comes to both of the companies that you've backed in the past. I mean obviously exits is something that draws in new capital to the funds that you've been raising. It it proves that you've you backed the right horses. What about 2018? You're both looking at companies that could be exiting. Are you going to see more IPOs than trade sales? Do you so think? I think the IPO market is open and you're seeing a growing cadence of companies being you know, successfully raising money or actually just listing in the case of Spotify on public markets. Um, we're also seeing a, a, a growing cadence of entrepreneurs who have the confidence to raise additional money in the private markets and build for a bigger outcome. And the investor groups and syndicates around those entrepreneurs being patient and being willing to 
back an entrepreneur again in order to see a bigger outcome. And we were talking earlier about Zoopla being one of the very earliest businesses to IPO for more than a billion dollars. Yeah. And that was seen as something quite unusual at the time. And now you have Spotify IPOing for uh, more than $26 billion. And it set a new, you know, a new ceiling and a new opportunity for you know, European entrepreneurs to target. Yeah, and no, I think it's a it's a exits are very important to us. Carry is a big deal of what we do, so you have yeah. to have exits to get that. Um, and the IPOs are becoming more important because I think entrepreneurs are back to the growing ecosystem. Entrepreneurs are better; they're better at planning their business, better uh, as a as a public business, and people yeah. are being patient. And both Elliot and I have been lucky enough to return huge amounts of money back to our investors. Yeah. It makes our investors patient, so we can be patient with our entrepreneurs. So it's, yeah. Everything is a, is a virtuous cycle, which is, which is a big change in Europe. Here comes a big change in Europe. Emily, I hand it back to you. Of course, Octopus Ventures and Dawn Capital here in London talking about the funding increases that we're seeing here in Europe. All right, Caroline Hyde for us in London. Thanks so much, Caroline. Coming up, after acquiring the magazine app Texture, Apple is said to be planning a Netflix for news in its latest services push. What to expect from the tech giant next. This is Bloomberg. Walmart is rolling out a revamp website next month. The world's largest retailer wants to lure customers away from Amazon with a more personalized shopping experience. Walmart says the redesign is based on feedback from customers and it could help the retailer regain momentum it lost over the holiday period. Walmart bought Jet.com back in 2016, but traffic on that online shopping site has lagged as Walmart focuses more on its own website. Now Apple plans to integrate its recently acquired magazine app Texture into Apple News and debut its own premium subscription offering. People familiar with the matter say the iPhone maker wants to generate more revenue from online content and services. Apple agreed to buy Texture last month. The app allows users to subscribe to more than 200 magazines at $9.99 a month. An upgraded Apple News app with a subscription offering is expected to launch next year. Joining us now, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, who covers all things Apple for us. So, Mark, first of all, we've seen the challenges Facebook has been facing, you know, being involved in the news feed, being the provider of the news feed. Why does Apple want to get into this now? Yeah, so news is a very important part. They want to be in every form of media. They have music, they have movies, they have books, they have TV shows, uh, they have you know Apple Music now, iCloud. It's just another thing that they think people will subscribe to. And so they're really going to bolster the Apple News app. First came out in 2015. What you can do now is you can subscribe to some individual publications. I know People Magazine is on there for $2.99 a month. You can get other publications, maybe you know, like um, and some, one of, some newspapers for a different price. Now what Apple wants to do is pull it all together. You can pay one monthly fee like you might for Netflix, Apple Music, or Spotify, and get access to a whole bunch of different newspapers and magazines. So is this something that people are going to actually want and pay for? You know, it's a good question. I think it comes down to how much people are willing to pay. If you look at it, some publications have paywalls right now, and some people might be paying 15, 20 bucks, 10 bucks a month for it. Imagine being told that you can pay five bucks or 10 bucks and get access to all of them for one fee, just like you can pay $10 a month for Spotify or Apple Music and get access to the entire, you know, online digital music catalog. That could be compelling for some people, but also not worth it for others. And what about the publishers? Is it worth it for them? I mean, we've heard so much about publisher's adversarial relationship with Facebook and how they're really at Facebook's beck and call. Is this something that publishers will really jump on board? You know, Apple actually has had a pretty easy time getting publishers on board in terms of these types of services. Where Apple has struggled is with the video-based content makers, so movies and TV shows, being able to create a service that integrates all of that, taking stuff away from the, uh, the video content makers, the TV networks, the Comcasts, the Time Warners of the world. But publishing is an area, as well as music, where they've actually had, uh, I don't know if it's easy because we don't know the behind the scenes work here, but at least from a public facing perspective, they've been able to pull it off. And I I think it's a no-brainer to believe to be able to get it right again. 
Now, ideally, this is all about adding to Apple's bottom line. We saw, you know, a slow start with Apple Music, but it has become a bigger slice of the pie. You know, ultimately, how much do you think this could add to Apple's business, knowing a lot remains to be seen? Yeah, I don't think it's going to add much in particular this news thing, but another way you have to look about look at it, think about it is are they taking eyeballs away from other companies? Is Amazon going to work on an app like this? Like you said Facebook has its news uh, integration and its news feed. Google has Google News, right? So there's a cost to not doing something as well, and I think that factors into a lot of the decisions that are being made by these tech companies lately. All right, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, thanks so much as always. Coming up, planting the seed. We talk with the founder of an early stage venture capital firm, why she thinks we do need another VC firm, and that is next. This is Bloomberg. In the past few weeks, billions of dollars were wiped off tech stocks, and literally in the hot seat was Facebook. Shares of the social media giant have been mostly in the red since news broke that a political consulting firm working with the Trump campaign mishandled data on tens of millions of users. And now new questions are being asked about data privacy with regulation looming. How is it all impacting earlier stage investing as investors fund fresh ideas, aiming to be the next billion dollar tech behemoth? To answer that, I'd like to bring in Trey Vassallo, managing partner and co-founder of Defy, an early stage venture capital firm that closed their debut fund with $151 million in funding in 2017. Trey, thank you so much for joining us. So I'm sure you've been following the Facebook news, the market volatility. I know the answer is often that early stage venture capitalists don't think about these things. But with tech regulation looming, with bigger questions being asked about tech ethics, is that impacting any of the decisions you're making on the front lines? No, that's a great question. And I will say that, you know, when we make investments, we really are making them for the long term. And so while we're seeing a lot of, I'd say, daily changes in the narrative around uh, what's going to happen with regulation and Facebook, uh, you know, I'd say we have some time to figure that out. One thing I will say, though, is when you look back historically and you take uh, large monopolies that do get regulated, it oftentimes actually creates opportunities for venture investors. So, uh, you know, I look forward to seeing how this plays out. Trey, you're credited with helping fund Nest in your earlier days at Kleiner Perkins, finding Dropcam, which Nest bought. These are companies that are at the center of issues around data privacy. I mean, do you think how we think about these things are going to fundamentally change as we bring more and more technology into our homes? Absolutely. Um, so I'd say whenever you're adopting a new technology, the consumer has to make a trade-off. Is the privacy that I'm giving up, um, you know, worth the benefit that I'm receiving? And it's not always obvious. Um, you know, when I invested in Dropcam uh, several years ago now, it wasn't clear that people were going to want to have cameras in their house. I think what we've seen since then is that the benefit that people do get from the peace of mind, the ability to drop in, see what's going on, and also I'd say the really important um, elements of security and privacy that companies like Google, now Dropcam is owned by Google um, as a Nest Cam, um, have been really important in being a, you know, at the forefront of laying down the right dialogue with their customers around privacy. Now, when you launched Defy, you wrote a post titled, Do We Need Another Venture Capital Firm? To which the rhetorical answer is no, but obviously you think there's an opportunity here that's not being exploited. What do you plan to do differently? Yeah, no. I mean, when I was at Kleiner, I remember, and as I was looking at leaving, a lot of folks asked, you know, hey, you're going to start a new fund. And it wasn't obvious to me at the beginning, partly because the venture ecosystem is overfunded. But once I was um, working closely with seed funded entrepreneurs and helping them navigate raising money as they went forward, that perspective gave me a total different um, view of the ecosystem. That money is not evenly distributed, um, you know, across seed through middle, through uh, late stage funding. And uh, what my partner, Neil Sakara and I realized when we came together to start Defy.VC, our new venture firm, is that the traditional early stage venture funds with success have all gone bigger and 
have tended to invest later stage. And so while you have this incredibly flourishing seed ecosystem, you have the traditional venture folks that have moved later. And it's left a bit of a gap in the middle. And so we were meeting with lots of seed funded founders who had great ideas, um, really um, some nice early traction, but not enough traction to go raise a 10 plus million dollar round. What they wanted were a venture capitalist to invest money, three to six million dollars, get on the board, work closely with the team to really help them navigate product market fit, professionalize the board, build the team, and get them in the position to go raise growth funding. So you're announcing an investment in agentology, which helps real estate agents deal with the inflow of leads that come in from, you know, the success of tech platforms like Zillow, like Redfin. Obviously, you yep. see hundreds of companies. Why this? Yeah, no. Uh, so there are several reasons that, that we got excited about this particular company. One thread that we see through a lot of our investments is we love investing in what we call authentic founders. So these are founders who have really lived this problem. And so they understand it in a way that your maybe typical tech founder would not. So in Agentology's case, David Tall was actually a real estate agent for eight years. Um, he understood this problem. Uh, fortunately for him, his brother was a tech founder. So he and his brother teamed up. Up. They surrounded themselves with other folks from the tech industry to basically figure out how to solve this problem for themselves. And so when David addresses his customers, the agents, he can do it with a whole different level of authenticity. Now, last quick question, Trey, and I know this isn't a quick question, but you know, you were very involved in the Elephant in the Valley survey, you know, which yeah. talking about how big a problem harassment and discrimination is across the industry. You're involved in All Raise, a new nonprofit to help increase um, funding that goes to female founders, uh, diversity and venture capital firms. Quickly, is this really a movement or is this a moment? We've got like 20 seconds here. <laughs> You know, it's a building movement. It started a long time ago, and I think right now we're starting to see critical mass. We now have a number of women who are in positions of power in their firms, who are writing checks, who are starting new firms, and it's really starting to make a difference. All right, Trey Vasallo, managing partner at Defy. Trey, thank you so much for joining us. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We'll see you back here tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.